Steven, it's my goal to try to keep this less than two hours this week. We'll try. Because I know we've got this intro, we've got this Joey L thing coming up, but I should probably do the normal stuff before we even start talking about that. Are we ready? <laughs> yeah. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com, and welcome to Raw Talk episode number 76. That's right. After 76 is 77, then 78, then 70. Anyway, you get the point. 76, we are up to, and this one is going to have an interview with Joey L. I don't think there's a lot of people out there who don't know who Joey L is in the photography community, but you are going to really find it interesting. If you haven't seen his work, Google Joey L photography, find out what he's got. You're going to love the things that he's created. And the fact that he started so young in an industry like this and shot up on the scene and continues to do it, uh, it it's it's fascinating. Now, Stephen, you were there. Yeah. Was it uh, pretty cool? It was a good interview. Yeah. I, ju- I just, like you said, I can't believe how young he is. And I mean, he, he acts like he's much older. He's, he's very mature for his age, I would say. He is. And that's probably part of the reason, or maybe not part of the reason why he was able to shoot on so quick. He probably learned quite a bit, and that's why he's so mature now. Definitely. And, and it probably helped. I mean, it's a really cool interview. I liked getting to sit down with him. And again, it's a testament to reaching out to somebody on Twitter. I reached out through him to him through Twitter and sent him some information. Once we started talking, he was all in. He loved the style of the podcast and he wanted to share whatever it is he wanted to share. So I love interviewing people and just asking questions. I mean, yes, that's what an interview is, but they're questions that I personally want to know that I think that most people out there are interested in as well. So we've got uh, photo news coming up. Mm -hmm. I've got to talk about Rode. Why don't I just talk about Rode right now? We'll get it out of the way so we can keep moving. Okay. Rode has finally put up their $70,000 in prize contest, by the way. Sutter can enter. You're not allowed to enter. (laughs) You're not eligible to do it. But go to uh, www. Sorry, www. (laughs) Which you don't. What was that, Sutter? Well, was that it. a hipster laugh? <laughs> <laughs> you guys should see Sutter today, by the way. We're going to take a picture of him, and then we're going to go to this place called Pizza Brain and see if the guy is working today to get a picture of him. That's not why I wanted to go to Pizza sure. Brain. It's yeah, really yeah. not. <laughs> but we're going to get a picture, and we're going to put it next to Sutter today because today he doesn't look like Kevin Costner. He looks like the hipster pizza-making guy at Pizza Brain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, www. So go to Road Mike dot com slash my road real that's m y r o d e r e e l that's where you can get all of the information to enter to win seventy thousand dollars in prizes anytime somebody's going to give you something to do like that i would highly recommend entering it but also they had something here that i didn't even know because they didn't even tell me they didn't give me that bullet point but submit an entry before April 1st, which means you still have uh, a month to do it, Mm -hmm. and receive a free copy of Red Giant's pluralized software valued at 200 bucks. Very nice. You have that. I do. You use it. I use it sometimes, I will say. All right. Because we we don't clap every time. Right. And we have to keep resetting the cameras. But tell people what what pluralized does. Basically, pluralized syncs up all your audio with with multiple video sources. So if, uh, you know, you have five different videos, you do a clap, or you have... Um, well, just say this. Say you had your main camera you're shooting the video with and you had the GoPro. Mm-hmm. You would clap and the pluralize is going to help it line up. Yeah, basically pluralize sees that spike and then it lines up the audio with both video sources and you have, yeah, it's a lot easier than manually syncing, basically. So basically they're giving a $200 program free as long as you follow whatever rules and regulations that they have and they accept your entry. They're going to send you that. So That's check great. out roadmike.com. You can go to their website and find out all the information or add the slash myroadreel.com. 70,000, or no dot com after the road reel, but 70,000 in prizes. Check it out. Thank you to Road Microphone continuing to support us with these road mics, with the smart labs, with the, uh, the HS ones that we travel with sometimes. Uh, just really love the products. Oh, yeah. And anyway, somebody's giving you an opportunity for a contest like this. You have 90 days, I believe, from the time that this is recorded to go make something and, and submit it. Uh, if somebody's giving you that opportunity, I highly recommend taking it. And that is what I have to say about that. Wait, 90 so, days? I thought you said the deadline was April 1st. No, April 1st is the early. If you enter by April 1st, they're going to give you the pluralized oh, free. Okay. But this runs for at least, I think it's 95 days from the time we're recording this on a Wednesday. Uh to, to enter. So it okay. goes for quite a long time. You have a lot of time to make that your is a information lot of time. out there. Uh, why don't you... Can I talk some about some other stuff before we get yeah. to photo news? Yeah, we got because, plenty of time. Well, no, we don't. Yes and no. Yeah, because th- th- there's things that people want us to bring up from like, like corrections. Oh, yeah. I found information about 500 picks. 
Remember when I said I the 500 that. picks was saying that it was 70-30 the other way? Mm -hmm. Well, it was originally. I did read that somewhere, and it was p posted somewhere. But they just posted on their blog. They posted that uh, in the recent blog that the split is 70% to the photographer, not 30%. So they flip-flopped it? They either made a correction or somebody reported it wrong in the first place. They had like an intern type it up? <laughs> I don't know, but... Again, if they're going to give you 70 and 30, that is a legitimate split. That's what we talked about. Apple does that. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, I've got two quick emails to read that are responses to flying solo questions okay. that we did. One was where I yelled at somebody. I didn't mean that. I wasn't yelling at him. You I know, say. Steven yells at me for <laughs> yelling at him. It was very upsetting. Okay. Hey, Jared. First off, props to you for saying my last name correctly, which I'll probably get wrong tonight. <laughs> my college didn't even get it right after I paid them $160,000 and gave them the phonetic spelling for my graduation. Second, wow. I'm the one that asked you why your logo is red when your hair is black. I would just like to clarify that my computer does not have a calibration issue. I... Uh, Basically, he has a calibration issue. I'll just say that. I am red-green colorblind, so colors don't exactly appear perfect, so I often make mistakes and have to use my best guess. Sadly, I don't think there is any way to calibrate my own eyes. Otherwise, I would have probably corrected this already. Mm -hmm. uh, if any of your photo friends are colorblind, maybe you can ask them if they have run into issues with this and how they have solved them. I'm curious as I am just starting out my photo career, and hopefully this isn't a limiting factor. Um, I should have mentioned that. I should have been smart enough to say that i mean we didn't rip on him fully no but i should have said that it is a possibility that he is colorblind uh and not able to see something now in terms of other people i will tell you that uh my buddy jim o'brien who owns newtown camera who's local to me is density blind and has some issues seeing certain colors hmm. yet he runs a photo lab and has color corrected at this point probably millions of pictures that he's printed so if he can do that and he works in that type of business and it's not an issue, then it's not going to be an issue for you. Just persevere and get through it. Yeah, I'm sure once you figure out which colors are, are rough for you, you kind of know how to calibrate, you know, exactly. or color correct. You or can whatever. compensate for yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. All right. And then the second question was, or the second answer, I wanted to take a moment outside of the... Okay. So... This was the thing about the Tamron lenses. And I also want to reiterate the fact that I was yelling at the 18 to 200. The quality of that lens on anybody's brand, not just Tamron. Sigma's is a piece of crap. Yep, Sigma's 18 to 200. I don't care what anybody tells you. Nikon makes an 18 to 200 version 2, which is better than the other ones. Canon's version is also better than the off-brand ones. I wasn't yelling. Okay, Tamron lenses, perfectly fine. When you get the 2.8 versions, you have a better chance of getting better glass. Same thing with the Sigma. So I was just more yelling at the low end budget things and more so yelling at camera people that sell to the unknowing public that they don't know about these crappy lenses so that was what it was so let me read this email Jared, I wanted to take a moment outside the public forums and contact you regarding this week's raw talk where my question was featured as I've said on Facebook the question was lobbed into your court while the request for uh, comment criticism. You answered my question and I thank you for that. I will admit that the critique hit hard. Immediately after hearing your response to my question, I deleted the episode and unsubscribed from your podcast. <laughs> Yeah, it happens. Uh, a few minutes later, I resubscri resubscribed and downloaded it again. Basically, it's hard to hear something you saved money for is a piece of junk. And I do honestly try to take that into consideration when I'm answering people's emails. I understand that not everybody can afford a certain piece of glass, and you do save up. But I have personal stories coming up here to tell you in a minute. Um, uh, basically, uh, but the pride issue aside, you did answer my question. The sluggish focus is the lens function, not a camera issue or a more accurate answer. I'm an amateur. I'm, I make amateur mistakes. I need someone to be honest with me, not just look at a picture and say, ooh, or nice. While some may say the response on Raw Talk was abrasive, the information was received. I hope others will receive yelling criticism on this week's Raw Talk. Uh, don't react that way. I uh, hope that people that get the information in the future don't react the same way that I did. Or if they do, I hope that you, you're bright enough to stick to it and listen beyond uh, what they want to hear and hear what you're telling them. There's a lot to learn. stick to times four. <laughs> um, that stick to is something that we've talked about. Yeah, I am not yelling at you, and I in no way wanted you to, to be discouraged. Let me take you back to a story that I have personally where I was 15 working with a bunch of uh, Sports Illustrated photographers. And this is a well-known Sports Illustrated photographer. There's many covers, and he was 
sort of mentoring, giving me some help, offering to take me on as an assistant. And he said something to me that I took the wrong way. I took that he he was telling me that this is a hard industry to make it in. And I took it as he was telling me that I shouldn't try and I shouldn't persevere. And and that he was basically building me up to say that you may not make it in this industry as a sports photographer. It's pretty hard to do so. I cried for a long time thinking that he was discouraging me. I didn't realize that, that he, that wasn't the fact. He was just making me aware that this is reality. Not many people can make it in this field. Just telling you how it is. He was telling me how it was, and I wasn't mature enough at the time to realize that. And I realize that now. I'm still trying to get him on the Raw Talk. And onto the lens side of it, the first lens I bought for my Canon EOS Elan film camera, because the camera guy at the store saw that I wanted to take sports, was a 100 to 300 like f4 to 5.6 nice i had no idea that this was it wasn't crappy for shooting in bright ass daylight slow focusing i got great shots with it but i didn't know what i was doing and then to compound the issue even more i thought that a 2x converter would solve all zooming issues why do i need to get a better a bigger longer lens when i can put a 2x converter on it so i called abes of maine from the back of a magazine one of the i would never call these people they're one of those people that it, they're like B and H, or they want to sell a bunch of gear. I called, and one was like ninety dollars, and one was one hundred and twenty dollars, and I believe it was a Tamron teleconverter at the time. And and the guy was like, "Oh well, if you buy the more expensive one, it has more elements. That's going to give you better pictures." But little did I know that when I went and shot a baseball game outdoors under overcast skies, that my f stop because it was a five six normally, and you lose two stops, went from f eight to f eleven. Nice. Because teleconverters for anybody out there who doesn't understand what they do, you lose light because you're putting more glass in front of your lens. What, Stephen? No, I'm scratching my ear. Oh, they put more. It, it cuts back on the amount of light in. So a one point four teleconverter basically is one stop difference. So if you shoot with a two eight, well now it's an f four because you're losing light. So in this case, because it was a 5.6 and I was a 2X converter that was a piece of crap, anybody, any good salesperson would have told you that this isn't going to work, especially if you called Allen's. They would say, well, you're not going to put a teleconverter on a 5.6 lens. You're going to now be at F11 when you're shooting outside. It did not work. My pictures looked hazy, crappy, and shitty. That's the same thing as crappy, but shitty was what they were. So I wasn't happy with that. So before I go and get back to you, I wasn't educated back then. I didn't have somebody taking me aside and saying, don't buy this piece of crap. I had to listen to the salespeople. So the reason I yelled at the 18 to 200 was for the fact that they sold that sold you that lens when they shouldn't have done something along those lines. It just It's not a quality. They need to educate you. And that's what I try to do on this website is pass along the mistakes that I've made in the past. So hopefully you don't spend a lot of money and, and feel like you wasted it. You, you don't waste as much before you get it right. How much is uh, that lens anyway? Five, six, seven hundred dollars. Wow. Uh, so I was gonna no, say maybe he just didn't have the budget to afford anything else, and that's yeah, what they recommended. And fully understand that. In that case, I still, if you want a major zoom, a seventy to three hundred Canon, a seventy to three hundred Nikon, it's still a five six, but it's not a mega zoom. It's going to give you better quality. That's you know five hundred and eighty dollars, I think, for the seventy to three hundred Nikon VR, which is a great lens outdoors, mm-hmm. and you get a ba- big bang for your buck, especially on a DX camera. That becomes a four hundred and fifty millimeter lens times 1.5 I, I also have a teleconverter too that i rarely use i think it's a 2x canon and i i mean i spent probably 350 on it brand new i rarely use it unless it's an extreme situation where i have my 70 to 200 on it and i'm shooting something you know crazy far but the quality just isn't there even with l glass yep two more things before mm-hmm. photo news uh if you remember max jackson he was the kid that was up against the uh color run where there was the crossing of paths and they didn't realize well basically you can follow, what was it, Raw Talk a couple weeks ago. We'll put up an annotation. Probably about two or three weeks ago, yeah. We'll put up an annotation so you can ch- listen to the, the Color Run debacle. Uh, basically, the Color Run was using images with, with his permission, but they used them in the wrong place that they didn't have permission for, and then he basically sent them a, a, a letter saying that he was demanding a lot of money and a bunch of other things, and they basically sued him for that. Well, once it went to the public uh, forum, everything kind of ended up working out for both sides, I believe, and we did an interview that no, he hasn't given an interview to anybody else at this point. So that is up. It's going to be posted on the page as well with the photo news. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we got that. And then the last thing, I think it's definitely worth talking about, crowdfunding the D4S 
Uh, the blowback from that interview. Um, you want to get into that now? Yeah, let's. Okay. Is it part of photo news? So I we'll was just going to end. You bring it, it up at the I end. I was going to end photo news with All right. that. So why don't we do that? We've hit on everything else. We've done the the road thing. We talked about the Joey L interview. Oh, about the Joey L. It was it was funny. Not only is he a great guy, we used Uber to get there. Mm-hmm. Not to get there. We left there using Uber because it was fantastic. We have a separate video to make with Uber. Uh, that gives out a custom code that's going to give you guys 20 bucks off your first ride if you've never used Uber. So it's Uber Fronos. If you want to download it and you think you're going to use it, they'll give you 20 bucks in credit off your first ride once you take it. And then when that happens, I get 20 bucks as well in credit for me. So it's kind of a trade-off. You can do that. And uh, oh, we also used F and V lighting during that yes. interview. I hurt my back carrying it because the whole bag so was heavy. heavy. It still hurts now, but. Remember, we did the Vegas thing and we didn't have lights with us? Well, having these lighting panels definitely solved the issue because they're great to have. The lighting was great. They ran on batteries uh, and they just took the interview to the next level, especially when you're on location and you don't want to rely on somebody else's lighting Mm -hmm. because that becomes, you don't want to bother them. You just want to interview them and not use their lights because that that just looks bad. The only thing that I hated about it was carrying them. We have to come up with a better solution to roll them so my back isn't going to get hurt in the future. Photo news, Stephen. <laughs> Photo news this week we have first up sample footage of the Nikon D4S's video capability. It's now online uh, via new trailer for an upcoming documentary called Dedicated, which was shot entirely on the D4S. Uh, the doc was shot by Corey Rich and follows photographers Dave Black, Robert Beck, and George Carbus as they use the new flagship DSLR. Uh, they also filmed a behind the scenes video for it. The documentary itself is expected to arrive later this month, along with the making of footage, uh, assuming to coincide with the official release of the D4S. And Nikon also released a product tour video of the D4S with its you know, internal functions and all that. Um, so yeah, that is all posted now online, and it's def- definitely something to check out, especially if you're thinking about getting this new camera. I think they did a fantastic job, Nikon won, mm-hmm. with putting, the behind the, putting together a walkthrough of the camera. It's really great to see how they make a trailer for it like it's a movie. Uh, I'm not going to go into movie speak right now, but yes, that was great. And the Corey Rich stuff is really good as well. Really good. He did the D4 one. And when he he did the D4 one, Sean Corrigan, who we interviewed before, was his assistant. Oh, yeah. He's in the behind the scenes footage because he was there to help them do everything so that Corey Rich did again. I don't know. I'll ask Sean if he was involved with this one. But the the, the footage looks fantastic. Um, Everything looks great. Uh, The camera, you could see the slow motion stuff that they did using the 60 frames a second. That stuff worked out. Um, Again, when it's professionals who storyboard things, I mean, we talk about this in the Fronos Photo Guide to DSLR video. There's so much that goes into the editing, uh, but the the footage that they captured was great. The stories they were telling, really fantastic trailer, especially when they're flying a D4S, which I'm a, uh, I assume there were probably very few of them at the time, oh, yeah. in a copter off the edge of a cliff, you know. It's got to be that such a scary thing cool. to do that. It, it's got to be. But with these professional videographers, too, you have to also understand that they can make an iPhone video look legit. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? So who knows if this is what it's going to look like to the everyday person, but the quality is still there, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. So speaking of the, the video guide, because I mentioned it, you can sign up to be on the email list to get the first information or all the information that I release about it and be possibly somebody who can review it as soon as it's ready. We're looking at a couple months down the road for editing. It's probably going to be about three months of editing because it's 24 hours of footage. It's pretty insane. But you can sign up at fronosphoto.com slash DSLR hyphen video hyphen guide. Go ahead and do that news. Uh, there's a new time-lapse video exposing both the moon and Saturn in one single shot with Magic Lantern's uh, raw video function. Now, normally this is nearly impossible since the moon is much brighter than Saturn. Photographer Colin Legg shot the scene on a 5D Mark II with Magic Lantern in the 3X uh, crop mode. He used a 2,000mm telescope to shoot it. And now my only thing with this is that why take you know, video for a time-lapse video when you can just take raw stills and then put it together in post? So he could have done this another way too as well you could have just taken a regular 5d and shot it with stills and put it into a time lapse video but i guess he didn't have a intervalometer or something like that i don't know who knows i know with the magic lantern i believe that has that built in so it's something definitely to check out it's it's a really interesting thing to see saturn like flying around the moon you know nice and slow 
Sounds cool to me. Uh, moving forward, there's a new documentary from National Geographic featuring the story of Steve McCurry shooting the last roll of Kodachrome film. Uh, they follow him on assignment as he shoots the final roll in India, and it's just a fascinating 30-minute documentary. It's very detailed. It goes over, you know, what was basically in his mind that as he's imagining, like, you know, what am I going to use this last roll for? And he's very detailed and specific about it. So well, definitely the, something to check out. The thing is, when you have 36 shots, yeah, and it's the last limited. roll... And there are Ever. only 36 you can take. You're not going to motor drive. You're not going to, you're going to be very selective. And that Extremely. really affected the way that we shot back in the day with film. You were more selective then because you had to think about, I'm on frame 32 and there's five minutes left in the period. Should, I know that I'm going to get 30, roughly 37 shots out of it because if you load it properly, you yeah. can get more. Mm -hmm. So do I rewind the film now and put on a whole new roll of 36 to maybe only get another five or six shots and then I just cost myself money by... This is what I would think about as a kid mm -hmm. when I was shooting because it was expensive to buy. It was like eight bucks a roll at the oh, time. Yeah. I was buying bricks. It was like 80 bucks to buy a brick of 20. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. 80 bucks, yeah. We have something like that. Uh, yeah. Maybe 10. I don't know about 20, but... Yeah, my math, sorry. I'm not quickly thinking about that. But you have to think of that. So to have only 36 shots and the last 36 shots, it's it's fascinating. But I think that also improved your photography too because oh, even did. these days with your D4, you still think about, you know, with you only taking 16,000 frames on that thing, you still imagine, you know, hey, I only have this much. Very much so. It's good I, to be selective. More so, um, Not as selective as back in the day, knowing that you only had 36 shots. Yeah. Obviously, you come out and you take a lot more. When I was shooting Modest, the, the first day I did about 600 shots of him, but we went to five or six locations. And you're limited on time and all of that. You so I'm, sure. I'm more free to try different things, and I think that's what happens yeah. today. Uh, now we have the Orlando Sentinel, a newspaper in Florida, told their photography staff that their current positions are pretty much gone. Uh, now they're asking them to reapply for the new video-centric positions the next day. So basically they fired their photographer, not fired them, but they just said there's no more photography staff there's now a photography staff that's more video-centric related. Uh, the only good news is that the new positions are only available to internal applicants, so there won't be much competition, obviously, from the outside world. Uh, 13 positions will be affected, and there will be only five photocentric positions left to reapply for, and the rest of the positions will be split between two mobile photojournalists, uh, two video editing positions, two video coordinator positions, and two managers positions. So in the end, they'll all keep their jobs. Uh, it's just updated for you know 2014's viewership with this whole video related yeah, thing. I if you're still at a newspaper today, it's a dying breed. Yeah, you need to know not just photography. You need to be a man of many jobs. Exactly, and we also know that 2015 is right around the corner, mm -hmm. and that's when flying drones, news station cameras are up in the air for when Biff Tannen breaks the, <laughs> uh, the, the, the clock tower's glass. You know what I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sutter? No idea. Oh, back to Jesus. The future. Back to Two. You don't know Back oh, to the Future? Okay, okay. I know you're talking about now. <laughs> Have you <laughs> seen it? Yeah, yeah. This is Back to the Future Two. 2 when they go to the future 2015. Yeah. Which we're catching up to the future very quick. I think it's October 24th, 2015. Going off on kind of off topic, did you see that they they made like a fake hoverboard video? I saw that. Yeah, yeah. With, with Tony, uh, with Tony, Tony Hawk. Hawk. It's smart. And like Moby was in it, uh, Schoolboy Q, a bunch of other famous people. I still haven't watched people. the full thing. The original Doc Brown. Yeah, uh, he what's was his name it. again? Christopher. Uh, Christopher Lloyd. Yeah, that's it. He's a crazy guy. I know. <laughs> He's just, he drove he up is. in a DeLorean in the video. Yeah. He, he looked pretty badass. Oh, that was Doc Brown? He yeah. looked really bad. Well, yeah, I thought that was just 25, old guy. 30, no, 30 <laughs> years later. I would love to see a new one. I don't know. I mean, maybe if it was Michael J. Fox's kid in there, if he had a kid and he was going back to the future or something because something happened to Michael J. Fox. Or maybe do they really want to do this? I don't know if this would be the right thing to do, that it's whatever year it is and they don't have a cure for Parkinson's yeah. and his son is going to go do some research to try to find something. And Doc Brown is going to help him because Marty's in whatever. <laughs> you should pitch that idea. <laughs> no, I, but that I don't know. I, I didn't want to go too far into that. But yeah newspapers if you're still shooting at a newspaper it's coming up on the death knell of the newspaper yep uh, now there's a new photo set at vanity fair by photographer uh is it chuck close yeah chuck close which features movie stars being photographed how did you have trouble with chuck close how no, did i wrote it? it long i wrote it wrong oh, i wrote right. it church by accident oh, all right so i'm like I was gonna church? Be like, usually when <laughs> you have something that's like yakov Shmirnov. no i know i just i wrote it wrong and speaking of yakov Shmirnov, does anybody know who yakov Shmirnov is i have no idea is he the guy that, uh -huh. that owns Shmirnov? no no yakov Shmirnov was a major comedian back in the 80s yeah he wore not you know like kooji sweaters but uh he I was, have some kooji sweaters was, i still have them he's he's a 
he was a Russian guy, and he used to go, ah I think. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> well, you know who Andrew Dice Clay is? No. Oh, my Jesus God. I've heard of that name, but you I can't guys, think of it. Dude, you, you realize how much younger we are than I know, you, right? <laughs> but Andrew Dice Clay, please go and listen to his albums on Spotify. Okay. You have Spotify because you yes. know how to use that. Look up Andrew Dice Clay, Hickory Dickory Duck. You know, and it's all dirty nursery rhymes. He was one of the dirtiest comedians of his time, selling out Madison Square Garden wow. as a comedian. When was this? This is the 80s. Yeah. This was probably why we the height know. of the 80s. You guys need to check this stuff out. Uh, he is he played a dirty character, but he really wasn't. He's a really cool guy, and he's in a bunch of different shows now. Watch, we're going to have like five people call us out on YouTube. Like, you guys don't know who that is? But blah, just blah, check blah. it out. I'm making you aware. As we get older, this is, I'm sure people did this to me when I was younger. Oh, yeah. And I was like, I don't know what that is. I don't know. You know what cocoon and how, is? how did you feel then? I probably felt the same way that <laughs> yeah. hipster boy over there does. <laughs> have you seen Hellboy? I think so. That's a newer one. Yeah, but did you know what new. Cocoon was? Co- I don't know. Cocoon is a beautiful movie to go watch. I don't know if it's a Ron Howard movie from back then in the eight. You know what Cocoon is? No, I don't think oh, so. So fascinating. The guy from uh, who plays on. Uh, I know we're getting off on a tangent here, but you ever seen Police Academy? Yeah, yeah. All of them? Yeah. I think all. Of them. I don't know how you've seen Police Academy, but the the, the main guy in that thing he plays in Cocoon, and Cocoon is just a fantastic movie with Wilford Grim, uh, Brim, the guy who is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Wilford Brimley, and I'm here to tell you about diabetes. 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 <laughs> so you've got that guy, but Cocoon is so awesome. It's a growing of age thing. Uh, just go watch Cocoon. I it's will. aliens. There's aliens in it because it's supernatural, but it's real. It's it, so good. Does it look super fake? Because it's probably shot back in like whenever. The glowing and the floating. Yeah. Yes, but it was. A, it's a fantastic, great movie. Cocoon one, and I think Cocoon two was pretty good. I will as have well. to watch them along with you. Have you seen 50 Flight of other... the Concords? No, yes. not Flight of the Concord the show. Not the show. I meant to say, what was that movie? Flight of the Navigator. Flight of the Navigator. It was a Disney movie. I don't think so. Have you seen Flight? You haven't. I'm even going to turn and ask you. You have to realize I was born in 1995. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. I was 14. Um, Tupac was dead then, right? Yeah. <laughs> Tupac. Tupac wasn't even alive. Oh, oh, he was dead. Oh, no. Wait, was that 96 that he died? I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Flight of Kurt the Concord. So, Flight of the Navigator. Yeah. I'm sure some of you guys know this is a great movie. Go look it up one day and back to photo news. <laughs> I'm just going to start this part over. There's a new photo set at Vanity Fair by photographer Chuck Close. You sure it's Close and not <laughs> church? It church? It's Close. It's Chuck Close, which features movie stars being photographed using Polaroid's 1976 20 by 24 inch instant camera. Now, the set is for Vanity Fair's 20th Hollywood issue. Some background info on the actual camera, which is giant. Uh, photographers had to be specifically granted access to the camera. There's only by, two of them left, I think. Yeah, by Polaroid under one condition that they share... Uh, the images captured with it. Now, four years ago, New York City uh, based 20 by 24 studio purchased both the cameras and the machines needed to produce the massive instant film and now allows for it to be rented out on location uh, in their San Francisco studio. Really? So I guess that's why, where this guy got it from. Uh, the photographer for this set wanted just honest images of the actors, which he feels analog does better over digital, which is why he chose this specific camera. And he told the celebrities not to bring any fancy wardrobe or makeup artist, uh, but just to simply show up in one outfit and that's it. Uh, so definitely check these out. But there's behind the scenes video of the entire shoot as well uh it's just some some cool stuff you too. realize that the photographer's in a wheelchair as well correct yeah, yeah. He seems he's to a be disabled paralyzed. Uh, yeah i don't know the i don't background. he seems completely fine i mean i don't know the background on the photographer yeah. either but you can he's obviously disabled or, or something is is wrong in that yeah because he's area. in a powered wheelchair a powered wheelchair so we correct. don't know what it is but it doesn't matter he's directing the whole thing yeah and, he's and still doing everything looking at the ground glass he just has he, people that are acting as his hands yeah and he's not moving the camera obviously i mean this is something that just needs to be on on a yeah. tripod and that's yep. it cool so yeah it's just some interesting portraits i watched it uh, another photo set that's really interesting features photographs mixed with watercolor called the 365 Project. Did you see this? I saw one of the images. Yeah, yeah. this is really cool. Photographer Eliza Rizel created the images. Speaking of Eliza, you know Eliza Dushku? Uh, is that an actress? Yeah. Probably. She, I'm really bad with names. Eliza man. Dushku. I sat next to her once in, in L.A. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I'm next to the girl from that movie. What movie did she? You know Ryan Felipe? Yeah. And you know uh, his wife at the time was uh, Reese Witherspoon. Okay. And they were in that movie called, they were in that movie where she's doing coke out of the thing, uh, Cruel Intentions. Cruel Intentions, yes. That was his big break, wasn't it? Or, or Ryan Felipe? That's one of his big movies. It was movies. one of his early ones. He's yeah. so hot. 
such a hot guy. <laughs> I, I don't guess. say that often, but he and the guy from Thor, and then that 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 guy that was on. Uh, I was live tweeting the Oscars, <laughs> which some people got upset about, but I didn't care. I was enjoying it. I was having fun live tweeting it. That uh, there's those Liam Helmsworth. Whoo! You see that guy? <laughs> oh my God, he's got some guns. Anyway, <laughs> so Ryan Felipe, that movie's good, and there's actually a Cruel Intentions too with none of the main actors. Uh, yeah, which. Is pretty darn good. That I, was I never saw it, but I just didn't it go straight to DVD or yeah. something. Yeah. All right. So that was my Elijah Kushku. So Kushku. photographer Eliza Rizel, she created the images separately, uh, which she then combined in Photoshop. She adds nothing special either. There's no shadows or anything to make the paint look like it's really in the image, which just makes it even more powerful. It's I guess she's a an artist and a, a painter, you know, as her side gig, and she's a photographer as well. So creating these two arts really make this thing come to life. Another nice. interesting photo set. Got it. Um, 100-year-old negatives were found in pristine condition in Oklahoma City's Century Chest, which was uh, dug up nearly a year ago. I guess they buried this thing 100 a, years ago. It was a um, time capsule. Yeah, exactly. Philly doesn't have anything like that, right? I'm sure they do. Do they? Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure everywhere has a time capsule, and a lot, a lot of them have been lost to time until somebody finds it. Yeah. Well, this thing was like in the middle of some giant building, so I Which guess that's awesome. why they didn't yeah, lose it. Uh, a Kodak Vest pocket camera, though, along with eight negatives, were found buried inside the chest, which was put underground on April 18th, 1913. Lil uh, was born. She was alive. Was she? She was two years old. Yeah. What is she? 100 and She's 103. Wow. Included in the images are parts of Oklahoma City that have since been either completely torn down or built over. There's footage of the uh, opening of the chest online along with the whole photo set and pictures of the camera itself uh, again another thing to to check out i love old-timey photos it's like the that. best i They're love that just stuff. so and that camera which was what six bucks at the time and that would be yeah, they bought to it like at 140 the, apparently they bought it at the drugstore down the corner yeah it was just cool because oklahoma city's obviously a lot different now and the guy the video talks about what's not there and just i love old-timey photos i'm sure if philly did that i mean they probably have I mean, that'd be cool if they had a chest that was like 300 years old or something. Well, you know? there's that website that we found. The Historic Philly. The Historic Philly that has images. The only thing that pissed me off is that it's not public domain. The fact that you have to buy it from them. And I would buy, you know, if it was 100 bucks to buy the full res file, I'd do that and get the prints done myself. But they're charging you like four or $500 to get something made. And it's just like, no. But what I don't get is how, how do they own the rights That's to those That's what I don't know either. Plus, those images are so old. They're over 50 years old yeah. that I will actually, I should go do some digging. The copyright shouldn't exist. Because it goes away after that 50 years. Yeah. Um, so, because there's my building from 1901. There's a photo of it That's in 1901. Cool. And, I, and I verified where it was because I could see the, how the roof was shaped. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing right here. It's my roof. Was there a lot of stuff around your building? No, it was just just the building. Barely anything in front of it. I what mean, was it an elevator factory? This or was an elevator factory back in the day. Wow. Yep. So there was a ton of elevators in here, probably being. Built. Well, they're probably manufacturing them. Yeah. So we have a couple more news stories. Uh, there's still hope left in humanity. A photographer named Dave Etchells, who is also the editor in chief at Imaging Resource, lost nearly seven grand worth of photography equipment on a Japanese bullet train, only to have it returned to him the next day. Uh, the train officials went looking for it, found it and forwarded it to a more convenient location for him to pick it up. Which How did he lose it? Uh, he apparently he took the wrong train at first and then he put, I guess, his gear down and then realizing it was along the wrong train before it took off. He just ran out forgetting to pick up the gear. Uh, there's a whole blog that he posted about it, though. Um, now, this give, one, me, give me a train song. A train song? Yeah. Uh, what's their big one? Isn't that is that the angel song? Call it all yeah, know. but they had more. They had like a million of them. Uh, there's the Hey Soul Sister. That's hey like that's the newer Soul one. Hey Soul Sister, yeah. I don't want to miss her on the um, radio. The telling the because they, they used to be considered like an alt rock band, like a like a Coldplay band back yeah. in the day. Now they're clearly just a pop, pop. band. Just yeah. right. Well, all they do is they write singles and put them out and yeah. make them hits. Well, that Soul Sister song, man, when that came out. I love that track. That's good stuff. It was good stuff. Pat Monahan. Um, yeah, Pat Monahan. I shot him a couple of times actually. The list of gear though that was included is a, a Fujifilm X100S, Olympus EP5, uh, Panasonic GM1, Sony RX102, Ricoh GR, Canon G16, Sony RX10. He had a million it's cameras. A bunch with of him. crap. Is Nikon what AW1. It's still a bunch of crap. Five interchangeable lenses, three audio <laughs> recorders, batteries, filters, cables, what ton of accessories. Blah blah blah. Again, seven grand worth of gear. Now, there's photos on the site along with his entire story again about losing the items. So you can see his point of view. I don't and, know and how he lost, he lost the it. items. Yeah, I mean, that would, he's so lucky to get all that stuff back. 
I mean, we took the train up to New York the other day, and we double, triple checked like, every time we got item, off. like right in front of us mm-hmm. on the side. And, well, if anybody tried to steal that back, it weighed at least sixty pounds, and that's why my back hurts. Yeah, you couldn't run off of that. My back hurts. Right and now. we were constantly monitoring it the entire. Yep. Ride. You know, we had it in plain sight. Uh, Hasselblad has announced their new CMOS sensor camera, the H5D 50C. It's a 50 megapixel CMOS medium format sensor. Uh, it Touché. Has, uh, Touché. <laughs> it has ISO sensitivity up to 6400, 14 stops of dynamic range, uh, a true focus AF system, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, now, the new camera costs the same as the regular H5D 50, which is 27500 uh. something that most of us can't afford, especially myself. I would love it, but obviously I can't, unless you want to give me 27 it, grand. It's interesting. Um, you know, going to those CMOS sensors yeah. is, is new. It's giving you the ability to do the low-light shooting, so mm-hmm. it's going to be very interesting to see it. I mean, 14 stops of dynamic range. You're paying for a big-ass sensor. So price-wise, it's not that bad. Yeah, I mean, for a medium format, for sure. Yeah, 2700 or 27,000 is what I mean. Yep. There's a new stunning time-lapse film uh, featuring views of Yosemite National Park. This thing's just beautiful. Uh, shot by photographers Colin Delahanty and Sheldon Neal for this particular project called Project Yosemite. They hiked over 200 miles over the course of 10 months, spending a combined 45 days at the site. Uh, they detailed everything from the gear they used to the locations they shot out all over at their website. It's definitely a must-see. I mean, this thing is amazing i would love to if i had time to do time lapse video this is something that i would love to do steven i have a companion pass to fly anywhere i know on southwest but i don't have time but you you need to come here full time i know and then all of your time can be devoted to me and work but it's more fun though if you get to trap if we get to if i get to throw a dart at a board and say we're flying there because i've got southwest and all i need to do is buy one ticket and you fly free um we can just go create a ton of stuff and they're going to be starting to fly to the Bahamas and Aruba and Mexico City very soon. Plus, I need to get better with just researching about intervalometers and just sliders and, and that kind of stuff, like just time lapse in general, because I'm not huge into that. So that's something I need to learn and, and pick up on. Maybe talk to Bruce Wayne about it. Yeah. Not, uh, not Batman. Not but Batman. <laughs> Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne, the photographer. All right. Uh, and then finally, you wanted to talk about this GoFundMe campaign that a photographer you know, started yeah. in hopes of raising money for a D4S. A D4S. Mm-hmm. And, and David Hobby, who's uh, the strobist, tweeted that he thought this guy, this was crazy. This was nuts. The guy was crowdfunding a D4S. Uh, you could jump down the guy's throat. You really could. It was worded poorly. His his uh, fund, GoFundMe campaign was terribly worded, and it really came across like he was asking for a handout. Now, he was saying he wasn't asking for a handout, but he... What? What was all the hand signals? No, I'm just seeing what time we're at. Oh, all right. Uh, he was not asking for a handout. Basically, he was... For $6,500, you can get his package, like the wedding package that you normally would get, and then that would help him buy the D4. It's just the way that he worded things was poorly done. Okay. And I talk about this because I did a, a, a special video that got picked up on F-Stoppers and Petapixel today, this morning, because I did an interview with the guy on the phone. I got him on the phone, called him through Skype, asked him for permission to record it, which you can hear him saying we have permission to do so, because he wanted to tell his side of the story. And what I sat there and said is, I understand what you're trying to do. I get it. But it comes down to perception, how people are going to perceive what you wrote. It's your job to spin it the proper way. That's why they have spin rooms after uh, political events so that they can spin the the, the facts, which is bullshit. But mm. in this case, I said to the guy, I didn't print it out. I didn't print out what he said, but it's on the website. Uh, you can also see it in the video. But he pretty much said... Professional photographers need to update their gear every two, their camera bodies every two years. It's very expensive. Uh, we put a lot of wear and tear on them, and they tend to they can go bad after a hundred thousand shots, which is bad to say that because we know that these cameras can go to four hundred thousand in most most situations. Yeah, you could so, definitely push that. Yeah, you can. So I, I know what he was trying to do. Somebody said it would be a good idea to you can you can hear the interview. So basically, go over to the site. We'll post it here on this uh, Raw Talk episode seventy six in the in the photo news section. I talk, I talked to him for 10 minutes about perception. If you wanted to do it, you could have said something like, oh, I want to try something new. I think it would be great to try to use crowdsourcing. I've already bought this D4S, but that's what this funding is going to go towards. And I've got these ideas to create. 
here's what you can get. You're going to get my wedding package. And because of that, and remember to sell the sizzle, not the steak. That's a major thing that my dad says. Yep. Sell the sizzle. What is it going to do for you? So basically what he wrote is saying what it's going to do for him. It's going to help me buy this camera. It's going to help me keep our creative edge in Orlando, which when I read that it's going to help us keep our edge in the Orlando market, well, that is, that's a bunch of crap. That shouldn't keep your edge. I don't care what you're shooting with. It doesn't matter. Now, I understand upgrading every two years, but just I get I, I get it. But the perception side of it would have been better to say, I want to try something new. Here's what I'll be able to do with this camera. I'm going to be able to create some fascinating images for you guys because this D4S is going to be great in low light. But beyond that, my backup camera, which is also professional, is a D4. Now I can put that up in the rafters with a wireless connection, get some angles of video that you would never see, to get some angles of photos that you would never see normally at a wedding because we're doing this. So this is an experiment that we're trying out. I hope you like it. Here's my packages. Thank you for your support. Let's make this happen. It's all about perception because I've screwed it up in the past where I've put up the wrong titles that were perceived the wrong way and people jump down your throat without even reading the content. Oh, yeah. So I honestly, I called the guy this morning and I said, I, I really think that I saved you a lot of freaking trouble <laughs> in the industry in terms of hate because he was getting so much hate from people. You I'm know, sure. Go put your head in an oven. Why are you doing this? Why are you looking for a handout? And I sat there and I read it as it's my obligation as a, I guess you want to call me a journalist these days because I report on stuff. It's my obligation to report the facts. I can give my opinion because that's what I like to do, but I also need to get both sides of the story. It's the same thing we did with the color run thing. Before making our judgments, we gave our we, we, we stated the facts, we gave our opinions on the matter, and the same thing happened here with this D4S thing. I got him on the phone, I countered some of his reasoning, and you know that that's what it comes down to. Just be very careful with how you word things so that you aren't perceive, perceived a certain way. And that is where I'll end it. Check out the interview over on the site. Now, did he, is he, want to, he wants to keep his D4, I assume? He wants to keep the D4, and he's going to sell his D3S, which only has 18,000 clicks on it, which, wow. again, when you sit there in the first line and say, well, we shoot 100,000 a year, and your backup only has 18,000, Clearly, it, it didn't doesn't really mesh up. with what you were saying. So the perception was... We didn't really shoot this very much. Maybe I didn't shoot very often. So you have to be careful how you do this stuff. Hey, the D3S is my backup. I've got this many clicks on my D4, but I like to keep that. And then I want to sell this. Yep, it was only the backup. Didn't get used too much, uh, but we did shoot a ton with other stuff. And that's why we're selling it. So here's the here's what you can do. He's a wedding photographer. He's a by wedding trade? photographer in, okay. in, in Orlando. You can you can search out his website. You can see his work. But the point of making this video and being a journalist and seeing both sides of it was to give people the facts, get his side of it, give my opinion, and then let people know that you shouldn't just jump down people's throats right away. Mm -hmm. Was it worded poorly? Absolutely. But you have to not take everything at a snap judgment. You have to read things. And what I said to him, which is what I'm coming back around to, is that I, I really think I saved you a lot of bad trouble by finding your story before Petapixel and F-Stoppers got to it and put a different spin on it. Because I used perception in the whole thing. I I painted the picture. Yeah, people, how I thought it should have been perceived. They would have ripped them apart. They would have just been, <laughs> oh my God, reading. how do you think you're going to be doing this? And the guy already took it down anyway. Yeah, well, when I first heard about the story, when I saw you put it up, it, just reading the headline, I assumed that this was just some Joe Schmo trying to, you know, get a D4S and, and get his hand in some money for nothing. But yep. it makes sense now after saying that. Yep. And so you can, you can read the facts, you can read the story, you can listen to the audio that I did. Is that all for photo news? Yeah, that's it for photo news. I want to jump into the interview now and then come back with gear of the week and the uh, wheel of fro. Sounds good. So what you're going to get right now is the 45 minute interview. I believe it's a 43 to 45 uh, yeah, minutes. Something like that. Yeah. That we did with Joey L up in his studio. He was nice enough to invite us up there. We uh, fantastic studio in Brooklyn. Uh, great interview. I got called out on something. We pulled it back around. <laughs> I think that's important that you get called out during an interview that you you uh, you get the right information. So that happens. But the interview went really well. It's very interesting to see how he got his start and how he made his way and just just to hear all of his advice. So enjoy it, sit through it, and then come back for the photo uh, for gear of the week and Will of Fro. So here you go. Yeah. Now, yeah, the the GoPro on the head would be an interesting way of recording. 
The, the only problem <laughs> with it, do you use a lot of GoPros? Yeah, I like them a lot for uh, behind the scenes and tutorials and stuff now. Only yeah. recently I started using them. They, they're, they're a little finicky sometimes, the new yeah, ones. Yeah. But they, they obviously killed the market with what they did. Yeah, I love the company and what they do. Like they're, It's like one of the most well-run new companies, I think, GoPro and Red Bull. Yeah. Um, just they're sending people to space for viral videos. It's crazy. It's smart. I mean, that's, that's, we live they're in a world. doing better than Nassau, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> As a private brand. We, and, yeah. and then you've got uh, Richard Branson and, I, and Virgin. Mm. You know, they obviously do quite a bit getting ready to send people to space. So what, I, what I'm most interested in knowing for myself, because I followed what you've done for quite a long time. You shot, well, you shot onto a scene many years ago at this point. How did you start at such a young age? How did you find such success in this industry? Uh, there's two main kind of, um, origin stories that I like to tell, if you will. Uh, the, the main one is, uh, when I was a kid, I loved toy dinosaurs and I loved Jurassic Park. You can see there's a T-Rex right there and, um, it still holds true. I still love dinosaurs, but in a different way. But, um, I got my first digital camera cause it was my father's. He used it to like take photos of his artwork and, um, I used to take photographs of my toy dinosaur set up in dioramas, dinoramas. Dinoramas. Right. So I had a website that I ran that and people would submit to my contests from all around the world. I would submit to other contests and you just win like web banners. You don't win anything, but it's how I learned photography and Photoshop. So did you start with film or you're just popping digital, digital shots? Uh, always digital. I'm digital kid come from that sort of uh, era when um, I remember, you know, when your friends were over and like, you can see it on the back. Like, I remember those days that that'll be our legacy one day when we look back. I remember the days when we were surprised. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I take an Instax around the, to, to bars. It's a great conversation starter. What, what is it? The Fuji Instax. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because people. The like, Polaroids? Yeah. Well, they're. Fuji's polar uh, that they yeah everybody knows oh, the little white frame yep, ones the little ones yeah, and yeah, I take yeah. pe- people's pictures and they're like can I see I'm like you gotta wait five minutes and I hand it uh, to them and walk away and they're mm. like oh my god because kids they didn't grow up with Polaroids at this point and they think it's the coolest thing in the world yeah so I don't know man so you were learning on your own you, you started um, doing yeah. these dinosaurs mm-hmm. dinosaurs <laughs> yeah. yeah you know um at that point I didn't even know very much about photography it was more like capturing the different uh scenes for like the like the website i didn't think i was a photographer it was more like the, about the diorama so it was a, like about how the action figures were set up or whatever so do you ever it's your website you started a site yeah but there were tons of people online at that time doing it like young dorky kids taking photos of dinosaurs and, and uh out. we had a little community yeah well, that's and, cool um, and then one thing led to another. When I was uh, growing up, I had a lot of friends that were in bands and um, I just became their photographer and took live shots or press kits and album packages. And that sort of built the foundation of my first portfolio. And where and, was uh, this? This was in Ontario, Canada. And, um, you know, just very small, shitty, hardcore bands. Nickelback. No, <laughs> it wasn't Nickelback, but uh, in the same in the same degree of shit, basically. But uh, no, and then I have friends that are still in some of those bands that are great now. But, you know, at that time when you're a kid, it's really cool to play anything. So like I'm very, uh, I'm not very musically gifted at all. So it, <laughs> I sing in the shower, but well, so I became the photographer rather than. So they, they, they brought you in. Were you looking for money then? Just was it just mm. I wanted to shoot. I wanted to learn. I yeah. wanted to hang out, be with these guys because I can't play in a band, but I can be a part of the band this way. A little bit about, yeah, a little bit like that. And also, um, it was my first job. Like I did, um, that was how I first started getting paid was doing musicians and, uh, for, you know, smaller magazines and warp tour and things like that. Well, but with that, you, you know, the whole process of getting to those people, cause a lot of people don't know. I mean, I used to sit there in rolling, St- rolling stone spin, go, I'd go to Barnes and Noble and I'd write down the phone numbers of every single <laughs> magazine yeah. and I'd call until they answered. And then I'd somehow get in touch to try to get gigs. How did you end up getting into the magazines? Uh, music magazines. I mean, it was a little, it was even a little bit different back then than it was now. This was like MySpace era. So I would just photograph bands and press kits and things like that. And then the magazines would just like naturally find out about them and give me a call to, you know, do a feature for a magazine or things like that. But, 
um, at that time, like, uh, you don't really care about money. Like I was living at home. I was just a young kid. So there's no pressure on you to do anything other than just to shoot, just to shoot. So yeah. it was a nice, uh, learning, learning time. It's like the same as going to photography school and being forced to have like deadlines and learn responsibility and learn how to run like a business, even though it's, you know, small amounts of money, it's, it's still relative to where I was living at the time. Sure. Now, you, you mentioned school. Mm. I get a question all the time. Should I go to college? Should mm. I not go to college? In your opinion, what should a somebody who wants to be a photographer, what should they do? Uh, in terms of education, I think that you need a good teacher. So a good teacher could be in a college campus uh, or a university like Photography Institute kind of thing. Or a good teacher could be like a mentor or like a, a photographer having a workshop or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't say that, uh, you know, all all photography teachers in universities are failed photographers. They do that because they can't shoot because that's that's not true. There's some amazing photographers who love to teach. And um, I would love to have a mentor like that. Yeah. But again, <laughs> school is kind of a mess. And, uh, you know, paying for... 50 grand or whatever for photography education, especially nowadays when everything is so readily available online, I don't really see the merit unless you have a really, really good teacher. Yeah. I mean, that's teachers. I had a very good high school teacher. I had him Mm. on my podcast as well. And the guy kicked my ass. That's that's cute. What? Your teacher, your high school teacher was on your podcast. Yeah, I went back. (laughs) I got him on my podcast. Yeah, that's nice. I wanted to. Well, it was, it was good for me to do. I mean, the guy mm. kicked my ass and the things that he told me 12, well, whatever, 99 was when I graduated. But what the things he told me then mm. to try to make me do better work didn't kick in for 10 years. Mm. He was just, he knew, he basically said, I think you're only good because of your equipment. And I was like, oh, fuck. I was like, That's not a good statement. I, what do you mean? And then I just, I stopped working. But, but no, then it made sense. Like you have to learn your craft before. You know, I was, I was kind of good with certain things then I got lucky younger shooting sports and things like that but I didn't understand the fundamentals but when you finally unlock the fundamentals of photography you can just do anything you want with it and then and then you can do it yeah like I always say there's um you can put in the time in a formal education setting or you can put in the time by yourself reading books or reading things online but you're still gonna have to put the time in you you know what I mean yeah and and I don't know I used to I used to say like my answer to this question used to be like, well, there's different strokes for different folks. Like some people need a, a school system uh, to learn that way because they need to be forced to learn. But now I actually believe that if you can't do it by yourself, I really doubt you have the work ethic to be a professional photographer in such a competitive right. uh, craft. And then it becomes a yeah. nine to five type job you, where, you, where um, you will work nine to five because that's what you can, somebody's telling you what you need to do instead of pushing yourself to the limits. Yeah, it's a very competitive field. And I think um, those who work very, very hard will get ahead. No, absolutely. I don't know where I was going with that. I was going to go getting ahead, competitive world. Uh, yeah. Speaking of video. Mm. Now, the world has changed. Photography has changed. Mm. You now have the ability to sit here and film with DSLRs. Or have you branched into directing and doing things like that? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have some um, great friends that run a production company called Variable. And um, uh, they've been hooking me up with some sort of um, photography assignments that have like directing a promo or something on the side. And we kind of built our reels just with personal work and yeah. doing things just for the sake of experimenting and learning right? Growing that way, putting it on the internet to get work and to, uh, get eyeballs on this projects we were doing. So, um, I've directed a few, uh, promos, um, uh, one locked up abroad promo for national geographic. I co-directed, yeah. uh, with John Bragel and Khalid Motasab. And then, um, I've done a like Pennzoil TV commercial with, uh, Tim McGraw and, another Coca-Cola thing that we shot as a spec spot just with my dad and then Coca-Cola ran it for her father's day oh, that's cool. a- afterwards. So it's a new thing. Um, it's something that I've been like going into, um, to learn more. And obviously I did the, um, I did the personal project that I funded on Kickstarter called people, the Delta. And that was the biggest project I've ever done, uh, in terms of video or stills, like the most, uh, 
the most work I've ever done for a project. And it's still ongoing. I mean, I'm still working on it. Yeah, because it's, it's one thing as a photographer, you go and you shoot and mm. you're concentrating on shooting. And then when you put this whole project behind it, you have to worry about your camera guys. You have to get the sound right. Because as we know, sound is extremely important when you get the video. So there is a lot that goes into it. But you have to evolve as a photographer today because very few people make it just with stills. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I still think that the two are, are very separate, uh, crafts. I don't really, there's a lot of people that say like, oh, photographers need to shoot video. Photographers need to shoot video now, but it depends what kind, because a lot of photographers are doing sort of like web videos and things like that. And like, there's nothing wrong with that, but there is like a major difference between the sort of learning curve of doing that stuff with DSLRs or like, or like directing advertisements and, and learning that function because, video is more um it's more working as a team like you take on the role of a director yeah. or maybe of a cinematographer and there's a hierarchy so that's sort of the difference between video is it's not like my photo it's like what our team creates and it's the vision you, yeah you are directing because we, we i've seen it in the past that a lot of the well-known photographers in the 50s 60s and 70s and all the way through today end up moving into the directing and yeah, film like yeah. Neil Leifer. Mm. Do you know Neil Leifer at all? No. He, he did ama the, the Ali shot, Sonny Liston, boom, that just f fantastic sports stuff throughout the 50s, 60s and 70s. Okay. He um, got tired of photos. Right. He just got tired of it because yeah. he's like, I've done it. I've, I've been here. I've done it all and started directing. And it seems to be a direction that a lot of the su successful people can move. Yeah, I honestly think that um, creativity extends to all mediums. Like if you're a creative person, I think you could be good at a lot of different visual arts and a lot of different things. And I think that people get tired of one thing and sort of, uh, you know, tickle around in another thing. And then what they learn, the skills in the new thing, they can reapply to what they did before and grow as an artist. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of just, if you're a creative person, just, you know, fiddle around with a, a lot of different mediums and see what you can come, come up with. And obviously directing is a, is sort of a, a straight shoot from being a photographer. Sure. Cause when you're on set, you know, you're, you're a director, you're telling everybody what to do. You're trying to explain a sort of narrative through a still, and with video, it's a narrative through a moving image. Yeah. So you uh, talked about shooting bands. That's how you got in. Now, did you do a lot of the the live stuff or did you focus on doing more of the portraits with bands, the things that most people never get the access to do? Most Mostly it was uh, like group shots and portraits. But, you know, sometimes when a magazine sent me on assignment, part of the thing was to get some some live shots, too. Sure. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how I got started. Like this, the typical like five guys in an alleyway with uh, the same dumb haircut, <laughs> <laughs> the tight jeans. As I wear tight jeans now. Yeah, me, me too. I just, I guess we just wanted to be those people we photograph. All, well, all all photographers fall in love with their subjects, you know. Yeah, well, it's, it's <laughs> when you can't play in a band, but the closest you can you can tour with bands. You can be literally yeah. the sixth member of a five member band because you're getting their image out there. You know, we're, we're pretty damn important to musicians these days. You can sleep in a van like a band. You can eat Taco Bell like a band. You can feel you, gross you can for not showering like a band. Four you can days. Do all those great things, yeah. Talking to groupies. You know what I like about groupies? <laughs> What's that? The friends they bring. Okay. Because the reason, when groupies, you know, they may be in the back of the bus having sex with the bass player, mm. but the groupie's friend didn't even know the musicians and is only there because the friend needed somebody to go with. You can sit there for hours just talking with the girl and not even hit on her i mean maybe a little bit but still you can just have a great conversation that's what i loved going from city to city is actually finding those people that weren't fans of the band they just were there because they're tagging along and you could just sit there and have a cool conversation do you have any groupies of fro nose photo i think there are a few women <laughs> there's a couple <laughs> that's funny man. yeah that's and the... i'm sure there's a couple guys too. actually there are a couple guys too <sighs> yeah well whichever way and welcome to planet earth yeah <laughs> yeah so you're doing those behind the scenes things mm. I want to know, how do you pick up an agent in London and New York? Okay. Um, so at that time, I was doing a lot of um, uh, work with uh, electronic artists in Europe, actually, like in Amsterdam. This, uh, he's still a good friend of mine. His name is Benjamin Bates. I used to mm -hmm. do his album covers and stuff like that. And um, there was one rep um, named Patricia McMahon. I just liked her roster. I like some of my favorite photographers were rep by her. And I thought, eh, why not? I'll just try to like send a little email out there and just, you know, see what happens. How old were you at that point? 
Mm, 12 and a half. No, I was... Um, <laughs> I like, took my uh, dinosaurs and I, was, I sent them. I was, think I was seven, 16 or 17, maybe 17, more like it. And um, yeah, so I just like did meetings with people and I met several different agents and she was cool and she's still my rep in Europe to this day. I've, I have um, a different agency here in New York, but, um, you know, if, if you sort of... There's hmm, there's a misconception, though, that I'll, I'll have to point out where it's like photographers like look at photographers with agents and think like, oh, the person getting me all this work is they have like must have a really good agent. But that's not always the case. Like I do have great reps, but it's literally everything you have to do as well. Like it's just it, they can only work as far as your portfolio goes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So at that time, I was lucky because one thing that they did do was they put a lot of trust in me because you know, I'm 17 year old, old, stupid kid. And, you know, maybe they'll, they're putting me in front of their clients who trust them and they're sending like a 17 year old kid that could look bad if I was unprofessional, right? It could make them look bad. So, you know, they did definitely take a risk with me. Um, but, uh, how did the clients take to it? Uh, a lot of people also think that when I started, it was easy cause I was young and, um, like they think like, Oh, um, that they'll cut you a break because yeah, you're young. Yeah. 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 But that's yeah. not, the, that's not the case. The work has to stand on its own. It has to be its own thing. Um, I was, I definitely have lost way more jobs for being young than gotten them. Absolutely. I find out all the time, like it doesn't happen anymore, barely, but just when I was younger, it's like you find out that like, why would someone put you up for this advertisement when there's like, you know, a client on set, they look unprofessional because it's like, who's this kid? So, but I, I, I can sympathize because now when I see kids who are that age, I'm like, look at this dumb kid. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and at the time I was like, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm really professional. But, uh, I was professional on set and that's what helped me build my first portfolio. But just people who are looking more for, uh, how it looks to have this kind of person on set Which rather is, than the work. Right. And it, and it, if, if they, if, if it was a blind portfolio review, and they saw your work and they picked you and then they found out that you were 17 and didn't mm. hire you. It's kind of a joke. Uh, no, yeah, but that, that, that happens too. It's, that's, it's In so the past, tough. Yeah, but it's tough, but it's also to be expected. You know, this is, um, we're human beings. We value elders. It's like, I don't know, the way we evolve. It's yeah. like to say that that's messed up is just whiny. And yeah. I, I, I would just rather just prove them wrong and just sort of uh, do good work. If you lose jobs, it's like I have a lot of time to kill. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot more time for me to be photographing more things. Well, uh, it, it's it's never really bothered me. It's yeah, well, it's which fine. is good. I mean, yeah. it's it, it. I remember I, can sympathize, I was yeah, I, I was fifteen shooting the flyers professionally mm-hmm. for some magazines, and they looked at me. Poor, like every security guard would stop me. Hey, kid, do you belong here? Hey, yeah, kid, should yeah, you be yeah, here? Yeah. I bought them all cigars. They thought I was having a kid, uh. but I bought them all cigars. <laughs> I don't know, just so that they would remember me because yeah. I would be there for thirty games a year, and then that was like. Oh, he belongs here. And if you act as if, I mean, acting as if and then being able to back it up is even better. Yeah. Because so many people try to act, you, you know, from being on with bands that we call, I call it the velvet rope syndrome. If you've ever been on the other side of the velvet rope and you've toured, mm. there's just a way that you act yeah. when you're with musicians. Mm-hmm. And then you can just pick out the people standing by in the corner like, oh my God, oh my God, and they, that have never been there, which is nothing wrong with that. It's just there's a certain way of acting on the road. Yeah. And when I first got started, you have to remember, I was like, I had never been on set on another photographer's set, so I didn't know how to act. I'd be professional and courteous and kind and you know nice, but it's like it's it's different because you don't know how things are run. You don't know like positions. Like I had to kind of learn all, <laughs> learn right. all that stuff as I went. Um, so that's kind of was nice, you know, starting on like these smaller things and sort of working my up my way up like tiny steps, you know. Was there a time that you had to establish some? You had to yell at a client, not yell, but forcefully <laughs> make them uh, give you credibility. Like you're on set and somebody wasn't giving you the time of day, and you needed to pull something out of them. Was there ever a, a never? They just they're there and they do it. Uh, no, I mean, you don't. That's not how you run a set. You gotta just, I don't know. You gotta kill them with kindness. You know, yeah. um, I've been on, especially when I was younger. When I go on shoots. Um, 
you know, a lot of people think I'm a PA or assistant, but I don't mind. That's funny. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, nothing, like, hey, it doesn't go get me some coffee. Me. Yeah. Like I can, I get it when they, when they say that, you know, yeah, it's, it's fine. You can't, you can't be so in like just into yourself and just be like, you don't know who the fuck I am. Yeah. It's stupid. I'm just like, you're a photographer, man. I'm yeah. just, I'm lucky to de- be doing something I'm passionate about. It could have went a variety of different other ways, you know, that is true. Uh, your style. How'd you formulate this? I, I see, we see a lot of, um, composite type work and it seems like the younger people or the younger photographers that composite is the main way. It's a good way of doing things. And there's some people that are saying that it's not traditional and you shouldn't do this, but if it's an art form and it seems to work, like what, how did you figure out that that was what, well, what do you mean by composite though? Uh, you would have a composite background. I do that sometimes, but mostly not though. Mostly not. No. Nah. All right. What are you talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about then. I thought some of the stuff was composited. I, I, Cause I know with certain photographers, they go out on a scene and they shoot in the desert and they'll shoot the desert scene and then they'll come back and they'll shoot the people and then they'll cut it all, put it together. Some ads has done that, but most of it's not. So then walk me through most of it. <laughs> put me in my place. Tell me what I just did wrong. Um, I think maybe what you're describing is maybe a like, like lit with like studio light on location. Probably to, to the point where it could look composited well, because there's we, so much light lighting and shit going on. We were looking at the, 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 it's always sunny in Philly. Okay. That photo. Which that, one? Uh, they're standing in front of the sign. Yeah. 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 That's mm-hmm. all just lit out mm-hmm. on the street. Yeah. Okay. But, so, so it's done right. Well, I mean, if you have a shitload of lights, sometimes it can look composited. Like there was a, there was sort of a, a trend a couple years ago just to light the fuck out of everything like backlights and everything. And that certainly looks composited, Mm. but, um, um, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of environmental portrait and doing it on set. It's not to say that, you know, some advertisements or things I do, you don't look out with a beautiful sunset. Sometimes you kind of have to make some magic happen or use a painted background or something. Sure. That that's a form of compositing. But, um, yeah, actually like my, my photos aren't really that Photoshop heavy. I'd say it's more lighting and, so that's like how that. the, and the contrast and a lot of that comes mm-hmm. through just from that. Recently, yeah. I mean, when I started out, I mean, there's heavy, heavy handed photoshopping that I look back at now and cringe. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, um, you asked me, how did the style develop? I just think it comes from shooting like music and um, dicking around with lights and uh, finding what works and what doesn't work, experimenting and then. I'm, I'm a big fan of like, uh, of cohesion. So when you look at a body of work, I think that you should look at it and, and know who is the eye behind that body of work, whether it's a photography series or a portfolio together. I like seeing cohesion and sense of like lighting quality or tone or look and feel, you know what I mean? So it all looks like it comes from the same hand Yeah. rather than being a photographer shoots like everything. And it's not really particularly good at one thing, you know? Yeah. Cause I've, we see you go to Ethiopia, you've done mm. that quite a few times now and you take lights out there Yeah, and traveling with that obviously isn't the most enjoyable thing, but it, it gives you those images that you're looking for. Yeah. There's the quote that traveling is only glamorous in retrospect. <laughs> yeah. When, when you get back, cause I know you're, you're about that. Well, we'll talk about that. I don't know if you can talk about that, but, um, w- talk about Ethiopia. How'd you end up deciding mm. that that was a place you wanted to go? Um, so that's been an ongoing project for me for, I think five or six years now since the first trip went, what year are we, yeah, five and a half years, I guess from now. And, um, the first time I went, I was just like a tourist, you know, like I went with some friends and I went for photography, but you know, I researched the country, um, but not to the extent of actually physically being there. So the first time I went, I didn't know a lot. I sort of went all over the country and then the next several times I went were more focused on specific areas or specific people, uh, that I sort of connected with. And, um, uh, each time I go with every trip anywhere, doesn't matter if it's Ethiopia or India or Brooklyn or whatever, it's like, it's always, uh, becomes more and more focused on a specific person or a specific group of people rather than just driving around the country doing a photo series on that as a concept. Now, is this just a, a project for yourself? Mm. Just something that keeps you creating? Yeah, it's a personal project, yeah. So how, how do you come about and National Geographic gets in touch? Is that just agent? they come through the agency or they saw some of the work or you made that uh, happen? National Geographic Channel is an interesting story, actually, because I think it's a, it's a testament to the times we live in, how they found our work. So 
Um, the production company I told you about, Variable, um, they do some amazing personal projects as well. And um, they filmed one, uh, John Bragel filmed one called Eight Hours in Brooklyn. It was just, he got a Phantom Flex camera, mm. he took it out of the studio and was riding a skateboard with it. And like, no one does that because at, at the time they didn't do it because it's a really expensive camera and like, you needed to tether a huge battery to it. And mm. it was sort of the first time that I think that that thing was just ripped by a kid on a skateboard. And um, I know Nat Geo was thinking about doing some phantom stuff for a promo of a show they have called Taboo. And uh, Andy Baker, the creative director, and I think um, some of his co-workers at the time were like scouring Vimeo and came across some phantom test footage. And obviously they had a production company linked to that. Mm -hmm. So they knew there was credibility in hiring them. It wasn't just a kid with a skateboard, but okay, he works for this production company. And then, um, you know, I was connected uh, to them by that job because I did the print advertisements. So after we did that kind of smaller job for Nat Geo, it's not one of their biggest shows, Taboo, but it's, you know, it's still successful. Did a good job. They kept us in mind for future campaigns. And um, I, they're one of the people I enjoy working for the most. That's, that's great. Yeah. And they totally get it. They're like so savvy and um, Andy's a creative genius and... They just, they understand this like new wave of finding work and it's not about, you know, hitting up a rep with, to get portfolios. It's like scouring to see who's doing creative personal projects that can apply that mindset to one of my projects. Who's passionate about this that's going to be excited to work on this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of that. There's a, there's a kid who was shooting Coca-Cola stuff and he ended up getting hired to travel for Coca-Cola and doing their social media and doing their photography for all of the uh, World Cup tour where they toured it. Yeah. And this is something that I always like believed in. And it's something I, I was a strong advocate of like personal work. But um, it's it's really has becoming true with all the people that have also been chiming in with this discussion of like, do people get hired off personal work? And the answer is absolutely. There's that um, e example of taboo. Um, another great example that's really recent is that, um, so when I was fundraising for that Ethiopian film, I did workshops and I had 20 students come, come in and we did field sessions and lighting and stuff like that. Um, one of the concepts that I always wanted to do was like a, a blizzard explorer. So just like rip a, rip a snow machine inside of a studio and try to make it look outside, but indoors. That answers his question. And then I was telling the students that, you know, this is a personal project. We're going to work on it. Um, it should be good enough to be placed in my portfolio, but it doesn't necessarily have to be commissioned by someone. Let's just do something badass. We can put it on the Internet. And then maybe one day I'll be hired to create such a portrait for some other brand. Maybe it's Game of Thrones. Winter's coming. Have you done hope, that? No, no, I wish. You want to do that? Yeah. Or maybe it's um, Life Below Zero, National Geographic which is true. What happened was um, it, they had some concepts pitched to them by an uh, outside company and they like used a couple references of mine and they're like, okay, let's work with this guy. He's done this before. He knows how, how it works. It's a personal project. He's clearly passionate about Blizzard. Yeah. <laughs> and um, they could turn into Dairy Queen. They'll call and they want you to shoot their Blizzard campaign. Bl yeah, that would be delicious. But it's just sort of like if you have the foundation as a professional and the personal work, then it's a nice package. If, if you're just doing those, you know, putting things online to put them online, that's that, that's good. And that's one thing. But also just having a little bit of credibility to show that you can bring these 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 projects to life for commissions as well. Sure. I mean, we, you look at uh, Honey, you know, Humans of New York at this point. Just yeah, shooting, amazing. shooting that stuff. We're working on getting to talk to Brandon uh, as well. That, that'd be amazing. That's an amazing We were going to come up and do it today. It just so happens to be his birthday weekend. So, so he wasn't able. But that stuff, mm. it, that's amazing. And that, you know, you, he just started that blog, puts the stuff up, and it, and it explodes. And that will lead to other jobs if he wants them. Yeah, or even if it doesn't, just the namesake. Like, everyone knows what that is now. This is the guy who shot People of New York, right? Or sorry, humans this of is New York. Humans of New yeah. York, rather. This is the guy who shot humans of, of New York. Like, uh, you know, everyone knows it except for me fucking up the name. But we've all done it. You know what I mean? It's a uh, it's a credibility thing, too. Um, it was a great concept. He got it in front of people. A lot of eyeballs saw it and it's going to help him. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have you have a team behind you. Mm, the yeah. team that you work with. It, it, explain the importance that it's not just you. Yeah. Um, 
so uh, for photography stuff because there's there's like the whole motion team and the production company of those people I collaborate with and but I'll talk about photography is um yeah I have a very a very bunch of uh, passionate people that like assist me I have a studio manager here um and um you know different f- editors I work with like on a freelance basis a couple like retouchers who do skin and hair for me um, it's sort of like, uh, for the photography thing, it's about, uh, trusting people enough, um, to get other aspects done so y- you can be a greater, uh, entity together. But still, I mean, photography is a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more personal than film because it is like, you're a photographer, you're bringing a vision to life. It should be yours. It is a sort of, um, a dictatorship in that way. Uh, but there's, there's no way that you could, um, that, that at least that I could do what I was doing without the people who like kind of helped me out and work with me. How'd how'd you find them? Like, how do you find assistance? Um, so Caleb, the studio manager here came through Twitter. Um, we needed some help once on a, um, on a, uh, advertising project and we just put it to Twitter. We need some, uh, production assistance. He came with his gloves on with like these gloves and just didn't stop working all day. And we're like, man, who is this guy? He's pretty, pretty good worker. (laughs) You know, he came from Twitter. Oh, that's cool. And then, um, you know, obviously beyond that, he's, he's talented and nice and nice to be around inspiring person. So, um, he reached out to me and said, like, I'm thinking about moving to New York. I saw like you put a thing up looking for an intern. I could do that. So since I, he already proved himself on set, it happened to be timely as yeah. well because I was looking for somebody like I get intern requests all the time and most of them are, you know, probably great people, but it's just like, I'm not looking. Right. So that was like good person, good timing. It worked out. And you find good people and you kind of stick with them for quite a while. Yeah. I, um, I, I am a strong advocate of keeping like, like teams close and working with the same people a lot on different jobs. I like to keep all my friends close and sort of, uh, divvy up different jobs and yeah. um even even the guy who's the my digital tech sometimes i like trained him and taught him what to do just because he's such a good energy to have on set he doesn't know anything about <laughs> capture one pro but he comes from music and it, and the, the the logic of backing up makes sense to him from what he's done in the past everyone loves having him around so if he's interested, why not teach him and they can become part of your crew? That's, so that's what I like doing. That's, that's good. You, you mentioned teaching. So you're starting mm. to move in that direction a little more. Do you want to talk about what you have, what you started to create? Oh yeah. So I've, um, you know, I've always dabbled in making tutorials. Um, ever since I started, like the first one I put out was like on a, one of those like blank CDs with a scribbled thing yeah. that I sold on the internet. Um, but I've always enjoyed teaching and sort of, um, recording tutorials and ideas and, and putting them out because I feel like as soon as you put something on the internet, you're done with it and you can move on to the next thing. Um, so the latest sort of, uh, variation of that or the newest sort of form of that is a website I have called learn from And it's essentially what I used to do on tutorial DVDs that were very long, but broken into different segments and broken into different case studies by projects. So I kind of go behind the scenes of different jobs that I've shot or different things that I've shot and explain like the, the, the lighting, what camera, what gear I used, um, what Photoshop techniques I use to sort of bring the images to life. So it gives people the ability to see everything mm-hmm. that you did. I mean, there's no secrets. I mean, you're not worried about there's nothing that you can no. say that's going to take away from you shooting the photo. No. And, you know, photographers have their stuff ripped off all the time. It's not something that I'm worried about because like you're never going to put a tutorial out and yes, there'll be people who like rip off and do like exactly what you did, but everyone will see that and be like, Oh, that's like a nice uh, tribute to that photo. Right. So like, I'm, I'm not really caught up in this. I'm, I'm a strong advocate for like self publishing and just putting things online. And I have the feeling that if I put something on the internet, I'm saying that the world can do what they want with this, obviously not steal and use it for an ad, but the world can sort of uh, take this, and look at it because I'm done with, with it. I've shot it. I'm going to move on and do something else now. Yeah. So to answer your question, I'm not afraid when I put things in tutorials, I didn't really hold any information back. Um, because each photo shoot is so different. Like each case study, I wouldn't approach, um, 
this assignment with the same techniques I used in that assignment, right? So I, it never worries me. So you're always evolving then. You're not just shooting the same portrait every time. Right. And tutorials are a good way to make sure you, you evolve because you can't do the same stuff uh, that you taught and you can't teach the same thing again and again and again. So it's been nice. It's been a mix of sort of like we've been filming some more stuff where I'm setting up stuff for the purpose of filming to illustrate certain techniques that I know. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the website right now, there's a little bit of that, but there's also just shoots that we filmed that I came back on and have like little bobbleheads and set up and show in a miniature form, like where the lighting is. Right. Yeah. So it's a video site and sort of like, I can just add things to it. It's not like, and you're in control of it. In total control. Cause yeah, you're not no beholden sponsors. to anybody. Yeah. I don't, I'm, I'm not a brand ambassador for like any gear companies. Uh, I have people, I have relationships work of stuff that I use, uh, that I will wholeheartedly endorse because it's good, but there's, there's nobody who tells me what to do or do that, do this or that, <laughs> which is unique in this industry. Yeah. Because- there's so much bullshit. Um, you know, with all these speakers and workshop stuff and, you know, I, I wouldn't mention anybody by name, but like, there's just so much bullshit with, um, sponsorships. I think it's a slippery slope for what they ask you to do. You might as well just buy their stuff half the time because they oh, yeah. ask for the world. So I just, I use and promote stuff that I like. It naturally seeps into the things that I do. It's all organic. Yeah. If we have a behind the scenes videographer or uh, stills photographer, it's going to naturally seep in my blog. If the photo looks good, okay, put two and two together. That modifier looks dope, right? That's how it works. This is what I use. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that, that's, these companies need to evolve into that to understand that that's the important thing is that we're just organically using it and people ask questions like the microphone sits right here. People always go, what a microphone is that? Mm. And we go, Oh, it, it's the road microphone. That's what we used. We go, that's just my velvety voice sounding beautiful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that gets the ladies just sit on the microphone. I mean, sit on the speaker at home. Oh, uh, Howard Stern. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, but, but that it, it's, I've lived by the same way of not mm. being beholden to the sponsors and yeah. turning down all, a lot of the sponsors that have come, to me have come because I've asked for gear to, mm. to play with, to use, put out some videos about it without them asking me to do anything. And they go, well, we love the results that you've gotten. Is there a way we could do something together? Yeah. And there, there are a lot of forward thinking companies, by the way, like there's a lot of shitty bad ones, but there's also forward thinking ones like, uh, Braun color is very forward thinking in the way they do like endorsements and like kind of, uh, lend out gear for, for things. Pro photo is very forward thinking, uh, phase one, very backwards thinking. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, were, we were talking, some, to, some companies are good. Some suck, you know? Yeah. No, we were talking about Kodak. I don't know where we were going earlier. Uh, before we started recording, we were talking about Kodak and Polaroid and, uh, uh Steven, you remember what we were talking about? We're, what direction we're talking we were about going? Kodak going out of business. Yeah. But what, I don't even remember what we were talking it about wasn't, there. It wasn't really in the regard of uh sponsorship. It was more of, a uh, of, of um, a, evo- um, evolution. Yeah. Of not innovating. I mean, people, uh, you know, think of Kodak as this high and holy brand, but they didn't have their shit together and that's why they went out of business. They didn't innovate. They, yeah. they pretty much invented the digital sensor and they're a household name, but they didn't innovate further. So they failed. They sca- They got scared. Yeah. They thought that digital was going to ruin their film business. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know the specifics, but like to mess up a brand like that, something must have went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely. not like, Oh, people aren't buying film anymore. Like, no, that's not the way that we, that the world is going in the same way that brands need to innovate. Creatives need to innovate. Photographers need to innovate. Speaking of innovating, what, where do you see yourself going? I mean, you're young as hell. Yeah. Uh, 12 and a half. Exactly. Times two. This many. Yeah. This many. (laughs) I'm, I'm four years old. Yeah. But, uh, what are you doing to evolve yourself to, to continue to grow? Mm, It's a good, it's a good question. Um, I am moving more into video and directing. Uh, and I think all of the things I'm moving toward are via personal projects that I am then applying to commercial assignments. So I am a huge advocate of just sort of, if you have an idea, just go out and experiment with it. And if you don't like it, you can erase it or not put it in your portfolio. So I think innovating and um, growing that way is very important and um, sort of just keep continually pumping out new work. And um 
I'm not saying to be a, a sausage factory and keep having to like cycle stuff out that's the same, but just sort of um, focus on like the little ideas in the back of your head and see if you can do something creative with them. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Absolutely. So uh, where am I going toward? I don't know, other than just doing some personal projects that have commercial merit and um, sticking with uh, the things that I am most passionate about because then I care about them. It keeps me up at night. Uh, it makes me work, you know, uh, 16 hour days, 18 hour days, whatever that seems to be the right path to go on. And and when you love what you do, the 16 hour day just, it doesn't feel like work. Like I, I, yeah. I lose the track of days. Is true. Just, Absolutely. Yeah. Just, I, I go out and people that are working there and it's Friday. I'm like, is, is it Thursday? Is it Friday? Yeah. What, what's today? And they're like, it's, it's Friday. I'm like, it's Friday. Fr- sorry. I was yeah. Rebecca Black. But. Dude, I, I love what I do so much. And it's like, it's, um, it's, you know, some, sometimes I'm on set and I always think like, man, like what, 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 um, what chain of events happened to get like this right here? It's yeah. like, it's pretty interesting. And I, I don't mean to say like everything's great and everything's bright and sunny kind of person, because obviously, uh, with this craft, it takes like a lot of hard work and there's a lot of bullshit that goes with it too. There's like high highs and low lows. Um, Oh yeah. So, but, but that is, uh, what makes me so passionate about it is it's just such a, a kick ass thing. Like you could be doing the most amazing thing one day and not the next. And you could find out about an assignment like the day before it's, it's a very fascinating way to experience life. Well, you could lose an assignment and then the next day when you thought you had nothing happening, yeah, when you somebody think you calls, suck, <laughs> you're like, it's like, is it over? Am I <laughs> yeah, done? Yeah, is yeah, nobody yeah. ever going to call me again? I get that again? feeling a lot too. <laughs> and then you get a call and it's like, Oh, there's Bobby De Niro on your computer, you right. know? And it's just like, we need you to do this. We need somebody right now. Grab a car, get over there yeah, and get it done. And photography is kind of cool too, in the sense of, um, you know, leading to experiences in life because like, say you're like traveling or something and you want to know about somebody, right? There's not many other jobs where you can just be like, Hey man, can I come inside your house and like chill with you for a bit and like get to know you? It's like, you could do that maybe as a writer, but to be to get so close and intimate with somebody and learn details of their life oftentimes the way i do it is i'm i'm being i'm pushing myself to try to make a photograph and those lead to the experiences along the way like every interesting story that i have to tell somebody to chit chat is mostly because i was trying to get a photo of something and that that's what i've lived by with musicians is that i would show up the camera stays in the bag we sit there and we bullshit and we become friends and yeah. they and they accept you in and then they know that you're not there to screw them over you're there to capture mm. them and make them look good yeah and that and that's that's what's great about what we do yeah especially the style that we do so you have to get onto an airplane that's you're, right you're you're going somewhere yeah. are you allowed to say where you're going yeah no i'm going to alaska today um so I, um, there's a severe weather warning and I was actually supposed to leave tomorrow, but we changed the flights today just in case the old blizzard comes, but yeah. I'm going to Alaska to shoot for a national geographic channel and the guys are coming here, I think in Soon. 12 noon. What time are we now? Let's I see. think we're almost ready to, we got to wrap. Yeah. But you but, know what's um, funny? And then right after that, going to Germany for another thing. Jesus. But you know what's funny? You're wearing a watch Mm. and you pulled out the iPhone to check the time. No, you want to know why? Why? It's because this watch looks expensive, but it's, it's literally uh, doesn't tell time and it's not worth more than a (laughs) hundred dollars. All right. It it just looks good. (laughs) Yeah. It looks good and it's really hard to read. It's, it's more, it's more for the uh, vanity aspect. Steven's got to look, look at his watch real quick. You got to You got to like, oh, it doesn't work anymore. Oh, you used to have to tap it, and then one blue dot yeah. and two blue dots would end up this, showing up. This one winds, and it looks expensive, but it's it's. Oh, uh, it looks good. No more than a hundred dollars. Sounds good to me. So, yep. thank you very much for taking the time for allowing nice. us into your uh, studio here. And thank you for <laughs> bearing with me as I'm so tired. <laughs> no problem. En- enjoy your flight. Have a fun shoot. And that's about it. It's been a pleasure, Fro. Thank you. <laughs> you never know, Stephen. You <laughs> may not? just need. You may just need Why a clap not? there. So that was the interview. Awesome guy. Uh, Very, very successful in this industry. I think you can learn a lot from what he had to say. He has his tutorials up on the site that he has that we know are very high quality. Everything that this guy does, I almost said kid. He is a kid. But everything that this guy does is quality. And he had to fly out to Alaska that day to go shoot something for National Geographic Channel. 
really just traveling the world, working as a photographer, worked his way up. Well, did he work his way up? He did. He he found a way in. He com- yeah, and he completely earned it. I feel like absolutely I mean, all the, jobs the work he's done. totally speaks for itself. Definitely. Um, and like he said about the, the the compositing thing is that a lot of his stuff is done in camera with lighting. So the fact that he's wrangled the light that much that it looks the way it looks uh, is is pretty darn fantastic. So that was the what he called me out on and. You know what? That's the point of asking questions to get the story and to get the uh, to get a react. Not I don't ask things to get reactions. I'm not that type of interviewer no, no. who's going to ask something to try to get a rise out of somebody. I'm going to ask a question, and you know what? He called me out on it, and then he explained his reasoning behind it, and that's what it's all about in an interview. Uh, so remember that if you guys are out there doing interviews, you can't just shut down after that fact. It's way too easy to shut down and be called out and not continue. But it was great that it came back around, and he was laughing and he was having fun. And um, I just, you know, go check the stuff out. Yeah, and you guys got a glimpse of inside his studio. It was cool to to actually be on location filming that interview. Oh yeah, and it's just uh, interesting to see all the stuff that goes on. Most of the portraits on his website were, again, done inside that that specific studio. Exactly, and the lighting, again, that we brought on our Mm -hmm. own helped us. We know this is an audio podcast, but we also know that it's half the time it's meant for video as well, and it's about quality, and if we did not have those lights, it would have looked like crap. Shadows in the faces would have looked much worse than what Vegas was because in Vegas we at least had some extra lighting. He didn't have a lot of lights there and I didn't want to bother him to use his lights. That just looks unprofessional. So having these F&V light panels, I believe this kit that we have is slightly over a thousand bucks for three lights. The batteries that they sell are like 19 bucks. It takes two batteries per thing. You can plug it into the wall too, but having the batteries is great as well. Yeah, and that's for a two-person interview. I mean, you'd think that three lights would only be enough for one, but it was clearly enough for, for two. I can't wait to see it. And the I actually tested out I the mean, video. I mean, it looked great. <laughs> <laughs> I actually tested out the video prior to uh, to filming, and uh, prior to lighting it, I mean, and I think I was at like 2,500 ISO. That's how dark it was in and there. And the 800, D800 would look like crap with D800 that. D800 after about 1250 gets really, really noisy, with video at least. Uh, and yeah, with adding that light i think i brought it down to 400 or maybe 640 around that and which was great i thought you said you were at 1250 the whole time uh was i at 1250 no i was i was lower than that oh all right yeah but anyway not a plug just what we used i liked it and now let's talk about gear of the week which is so happens to be a thing from fnv Whatever. This came in one of the packages. I think it came in with... Uh, what did it come with? Yeah, I, th- I believe the, it came with the panels. The came with the light panel. panels? Yeah. So I may have an extra the one The small six-inch ones. Yeah, I think you have two of them. So basically what this is, you know how I put the GoPro on top of my camera for the first-person shooter project, which I actually haven't done in a while, and I rigged it up? This thing is better than what I used to rig it up. I don't know if they sell this separately on their website. What does that say? Patent? What does that say? Can you read those little words? Uh, that says patented by F and V. All right. So then they probably do sell these. If they have a patent for it, this is what I really want. You, it's your so, one, one stop solution for what you do for yeah, for the GoPro, for the GoPro. It, has the, it has the cold shoe part that this goes into the hot shoe of your camera. Then you put the GoPro with the uh, GoPro uh, Frame. foot. You mm-hmm. have to get the tripod foot for it. And then that screws into here. And then you could even change the angles and do whatever you need to do this is an item that I recommend having in your bag if you are a GoPro shooter and you want to attach this to the top of your camera. It puts it up just a little bit off and it puts it a little higher than it normally does, but you can play with the tilting and panning and put it where you want. This is much a much better solution than the one I've been using. Oh, yeah. Because the one I've been using, you can never get the two things to line up and mm-hmm. they're never straight. This allows me to just change this. Mm-hmm. Boom, Perfectly straight with your lens. Straight. It's great for if you're doing a behind-the-scenes video of the photo shoot or something. You know, you want that first-person point of view kind of thing, so... Exactly. That's a perfect solution. All right. So now we're going to get ready for the Wheel of Fro. We good on time? Uh, four All right. Yeah. All right. So you'll, you'll, we'll probably go over as always. But yeah, this is an awesome little to- item. I don't know what they sell for on their site. I would highly recommend picking them up. And that's what you've got. So it's Wheel of Fro time. And uh, what do we have here? It's, it's the Wheel of Fro. It's the same thing we have each and every week. I'm going to try to get some other stuff on there in the future, but let's just read around the Wheel of Fro that we spin every week. we got the Adorama Picks section. You're going to get some Adorama Picks uh, photo books or Illuminized prints or whichever we decide to give you at that time. Borrow lenses is either two... I still haven't figured it out. It's either 200 or $250 in credit. I think it said 200 before. I think it's 250 though. I think that's what you or gave the last guy. Whatever. Uh, Squarespace gives you a, a year of the professional and Squarespace, which I believe is 180 some bucks for the year. 
You got the Fronos Photo Flash Guide, more Adorama Picks, my Beginner Guide, Think Tank Photo, which they'll give you a nice bag, which is cool. Rode Microphones, they give you, they've been doing a smart video mic go, which has been awesome. Uh, and Lexar, we can't forget Lexar. They got the Smart Hub that they may give you and a question mark. Question mark means you get to pick whatever you want off the wheel. We're going to spin it first before I tell you who is playing for the prize. Oh, Steven's gearing up to say something. Wheel of Rome! <laughs> there we go. I just want to get a really good spinny McSpinnerson. Oh, Jesus. I'm going to keep spinning because I slowed it down. And, and by the way, uh, Steven over here balanced it out for us so it doesn't rotate too far. And, oh, we almost had a question mark. And Adorama Picks! Yeah, woo! All right, so what we have here for the winner... Robert Timpko Photography, you, my friend, have won an Adorama Picks something or other. I don't know how much we give you, but it's enough <laughs> to get a photo book, which can run for 100 bucks or more, anywhere from 70 to 100 bucks. Well, that's a pretty good prize. So congratulations to Robert Timpko on being this week's Wheel of Fro Spinner McWinner. Oh, and a place that I'm going to go from here on out to grab the Wheel of Fro people is the Fronos Photo uh, DSLR video guide email list. So you can sign up at Fronos Photo. Uh, this is where you go to sign up. Fronosphoto.com slash DSLR hyphen video hyphen guide. And that's it. Sign up there. Why are you laughing at me? You just love hyphen, hyphens. Well, it just makes it easier. <laughs> I know. We've had this conversation. We, we do this every week. But the link is over on the page. You sign up there. That is a specific list to just get on to get information about this DSLR video guide. As we start rolling out some behind-the-scenes looks and photos and different things, which I haven't done yet, that is where this information is going to happen. I'm also going to pick from here for Wheel of Fro going forward and the 10 or 12 people that are going to get to review the guide firsthand. So that is where we're going to be doing that stuff. So please sign up on there. And uh, yeah, you got anything else to add before we go? No, I don't think so. No? No. No? No? No. <laughs> All right. Big thank you to Rode Microphone for their support. And don't forget about their contest. Go to rodemike.com slash myroadreel, R-O-D-E-R-E-E-L, to check out that thing. And if you do submit something and you qualify, which means you submit something that follows the rules, before April 1st, they're going to give you a $200 program, plural eyes, for free. Can't turn that. That's pretty good if you want to get program. into video. Yeah. Uh, that's going to help you out a lot. Big thank you to Joey L for allowing us to come up to the studio with all our gear and sit there and ask him all the questions that we wanted to ask. Uh, really cool to get that Uber video going pretty soon. If you want to ch sign up for Uber and get $20 off your first ride, use the code UberFroNose, all one word. Enter that into the application, which is free to download. And uh, it is more expensive to use Uber. But it got us from point A to point B for maybe it was like when we took a regular ca cab from the train station to Brooklyn, mm -hmm. it was 30, 30 some something? dollars. Yeah. It ended up being $45 in one of those really huge Mercedes is what we yeah. ended up getting. We're legit Mercedes. With a awesome. professional driver, the Mercedes, there was water in the back, there was mints, there were magazines. It was. It ended up being forty-five bucks with tip. Yeah. So yes, it was a little more expensive, totally but we were in the middle it. of nowhere. They find us through the app once you tell them, and it was awesome. So you'll get twenty bucks off your first ride, and when you do that and take your first ride, I get twenty bucks in credit, and then in in turn you can turn around and do the same thing. You're gonna get a code from Uber. You can share that with your friends. It's called internet. It's called uh, affiliate marketing. You can share that code with your friends, and when they sign up, they get twenty bucks off. You end up getting twenty bucks off. Time, Stephen. You have two minutes. All right, so an hour. Like no, like no oh, to finish that. it yeah, up. Yeah. Like I hit the eighteen. So. All right, well, stop talking so I can finish this up. <laughs> um, so really, thank you to everybody. This was cool. Check out that Max Jackson interview. Check out the crowdfunding thing. That is Raw Talk episode number seventy six. And my name is. You ready? <laughs> Jared Poland. Froknowsphoto. See ya. <laughs>